Señor, Let's do your name. You are the King of glory, the Creator of all things, and I worship you. I give my life to you. I fall down on my knees and I worship you. I give my down on my knees, Jesus, as your spirit moves upon me, you meet my deepest need, and I will lift my hands up to your door. Your mercy I receive free and I will lift up my voice to praise your name for all eternity and I worship you I give my
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, yes, Lord. Lift your voice and praise him. Go ahead. Oh, yes,
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus.
молодые! О, ма! We will stand back and let you move Stand back and let you move Stand back and see what you will do <laughs> We will stand back and let you move Stand back and let you move Stand back and see what you will do Say that with me now We will stand back and let you move Stand back and let you move Stand back and see what you will do something just a little bit different everybody stand up did you know it's only like five weeks till Christmas can you believe that 
It may not feel like Christmas outside, but it's um, it's about five weeks of Christmas. I want to ask a question. How many here, this is going to be your first Christmas on fire for God? You have either, either backslidden and got right with God or you're unsaved and you got right with God. This is going to be your first Christmas on fire for God. Lift your hand. Wow. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Freeze. Are you telling me all of you guys got right with God this year? All right. I want to do something. Now, how many, how many here have unsaved loved ones and family members that you want to see saved? All right. We're going to do something. Lindell, I want you to play a Christmas. Oh, come all you faithful. And I want, the, the, I want our um, shofar up here. And what we're going to do, we're going to play the show for after, oh, come all you faithful. But right now, everyone who has gotten saved or you've gotten on fire for God in, since last Christmas, okay, and that means in, basically in 1999, you've, God has turned your life around, I want you to come and stand on the platform, okay? Y'all can go right around there. I need your voices, so on this. So go around. Come on. Because this right here is going to, we're going to shove this in the devil's face. Now, folks, this represents a drop of what God has been doing. This is just, this is Friday. Did you know tonight we have about 300 Bible school students? A lot of them got right with God this year or the year before, and they're out on the streets. So a lot of them would be here. A lot of them got saved at the revival. But this is a bunch of folks right here that I just, I just want to pause for a minute and let the devil get a good look at this. to sing um, I want us to sing a, this Christmas carol and I want you to imagine in a minute we're gonna sound this shofar and break down the walls I just believe that God's gonna do something in the natural God has put this on our hearts those of you that receive our newsletter um, you I, I believe the next mailing this goes out we're we're um, gonna talk about the December 31st service is gonna be here uh, we're gonna be praying for lost loved ones and people are sending in us the names of all their lost loved ones and uh, way ahead of time because I believe God's going to do something this Christmas season. I, I do. I believe people are scared. They're asking questions they want to know. People are wondering. People are thinking of their childhood. Many that were raised in Christendom that have, that have fallen away are going to come back to God. I believe that. But what we're, I just want us to sing this, O Come All Ye Faithful. We'll sing the verse, Linda, then if we could sing one of the choruses. And I want us right now, I want you to imagine... I want you to imagine all your lost loved ones. See, this is easy for me to do because I've seen my whole family saved in the last couple years. I've seen the intellectuals in my family. Anybody got any intellectuals in your family? I've had new intellectuals. I've had new agers. I've seen my whole family saved, and they're on fire for God. And this Christmas, they're worshiping Jesus. And so it's not hard for me to believe. It's not hard for me to believe for your family. And I still got extended family. I got family on Jerry's, my wife's side. But my whole family has been saved. And so, friend, when, you, when we sing this, I want you to imagine that family member. 
being one of the ones that is coming. This is, oh, come all ye faithful. And I want you to see them. I want you to see them saved. I don't care what they're involved in. That makes no difference. We could talk all night about what these people were involved in. And I promise you, your loved one is represented up here. Your loved one is represented up here. And so if you think they could never be saved, shame on you. Shame on you. There's nobody outside like that. God hand is not shortened that he cannot save. He can touch your family. Let's sing this, Lyndall. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye all come, to sing that again but there's many of you in this room in the balcony that are not right with God yet tonight tonight at the end of this service you're gonna leave out of here so saved so on fire for God knowing knowing without a shadow of a doubt and friend it'll change this Christmas season it'll change Thanksgiving but I mean when I got saved and I'll never forget my first church service after being on drugs for so many years, being in a church service and singing songs like Joy to the World, the Lord has come. Everything was so personal. Everything was so personal. And this song right here, I'd cry my eyes out. Still do. Because I'm one of his faithful now. Come and adore him, born the king of angels. Let's sing this one more time. Oh, come To. We're going to sound the show far, and I want this group right here that's behind me. I want you to let out a shout. Everyone's going to shout, but I want you to shout. This symbolizes, you just, I want you to imagine the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho were impossible. There was no way to penetrate them. Here's this army marching around and around and around, and all they're doing is obeying God, and God's going to take over. And there's people right here, all they see are walls around their loved ones. They cannot imagine them, those walls coming down, walls of alcoholism, walls of divorce, walls of bitterness, walls of hatred, walls of drugs. We're going to sound this shofar. Father, you said if we ask anything according to your will that you'll hear us. And the salvation of our loved ones is according to your will. I want you to let out a shout.
bless you. Bless the Lord. You may be seated. Well, I tell you what, I believe, I feel some trembling in, in, in the underworld. I love to do stuff like this, friend, just to remind Satan. When he starts messing with people, you know, some of these folks were drug addicts and alcoholics, teen challenge guys. Listen to me, friend. Let me just say something to the devil. Devil, it seems like you would learn. When you go messing with somebody, when you go mess messing with somebody, you try to destroy them, and then they get saved. They're 10 times, 100 times more of a threat to your kingdom now. It seemed like he would understand that. He's listening. Tonight, if you're on drugs, if you're on alcohol, if you're in bondage to anything, we want to pray for you. God's going to set you free. I said God's going to set you free. He's going to deliver you. Hallelujah. What are you talking about, Steve? I'm telling you, friend, we have watched people set free from $100, $200, $300 a day crack habits just like that. Alcoholics, 23 years alcoholism, 25 years set free. Smokers, smoked all their life, set free just like that. We've seen it around these altars over the last four and a half years. Hallelujah. How many believe in miracles? Lots of them. Hallelujah. I'm just one of those people, friend. I preached on faith on Tuesday night up in Louisiana and in Monroe. And I just... How many are from Louisiana here? I thought so. All right, if you're not from the Louisiana, shout. Just want to let you know they're here too, all right? <laughs> Hallelujah. But faith, after you've seen what we've seen, it's like my children. I've got a 12-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 4-year-old. They know that Daddy is going to take care of them. They know that. Why? Because they've seen it. They've seen Daddy take care of them. They've seen daddy feed them. They've seen daddy clothe them. And my kids don't wake up in the morning wondering whether or not daddy's going to be faithful. As a matter of fact, they don't pray as they walk over to the cupboard. They know daddy and mommy have already been to the grocery store. They know we've already been to the grocery store and we've already put some stuff in the cupboard for them to eat. And after you've seen that, my children will speak boldly about mom and dad because they know they can trust them. After we've seen God work the miracles that he's, that he's worked, you got such faith in him. So I'm saying to those of you tonight that don't have any faith, we've got faith for you, friend. I've seen too much. And I know there's people here tonight, you're down and out, you can't imagine God touching you. Well, three and a half million people have come through this church. And hundreds of thousands of those people that have come through this church also have imagined that God wasn't going to touch them. Or God, they were too far gone and God couldn't touch them. But he did. And he's going to touch you. At the end of the service, we're going to pray with everybody. How many of this is your first week at Revival? Lift up your hand. First week. Hallelujah. God bless you. Now, where? how many are from outside the United States? Lift up your hand. Outside the U.S. Wow. Welcome. Now, are you from a group? Are you from Teen Challenge or something? Greensboro, North Carolina. All right. Tonight's message is, is like a custom fit, guys. I mean, it's God's going to speak to you tonight. I didn't know you were going to be here, but God did. God's given me a, God's given me a word for tonight, friend. And you, I believe you're going to enjoy it. But also, it's going to be food for thought. 
Many, 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 many of you are going to get so right with God. Hallelujah. But before we do that, we're going to take up an offering. And all the Teen Challenge guys shouted. I'm scared. No, I just want, we want to pray for you. I want everyone standing. Choir, I want you to just, um, you're going to join me in this prayer. Lyndall is, um, in my humble opinion, the, um, the greatest minister of music in the nation. Now, if you're a minister of music and you got a great one at your church or whatever, don't get mad, okay? I'm just, God has, my, has raised this man of God up. And there is inside him the music and the words to carry the church of God into the new millennium. I, I believe that. I believe inside him. It's inside there. It's, it's, um, it's, it's something in the spirit of man. People ask me about my messages, and my messages are, are deep inside, and they come out. And the songs are inside him. One of the songs we sang tonight was one of the ones that he's written, and I was watching everybody just worshiping God. You knew the song. You weren't even thinking about it. It's one of the songs he wrote, and you were just totally in, into it, into worshiping God through it. And that's the kind of anointing on his life. But I want to pray for him. I want us to pray for him because Lyndall's going to be do, doing some writing in the, in the near future. And um, it's not something that you just do, okay? There are times, I mean, you, those of you that pastor, it's difficult to get messages sometimes. And it's not like, well, I'll just sit down and write a song. Sometimes you can sit down and write choruses and verses and all. But other times there's just an anointing that flows and you get into the beginning of a song and you follow it all the way to the end. And that's the way it is with a message of uh, pastors and evangelists. You know, I've, I've had that happen. Just It goes all the way to the end. You go, God, you know, the bookends are here, the whole thing. You just gave the whole thing. I want us to pray for Lyndall that God would bless him, that God would give him wisdom, that God would give him words. Because we, without music, where would we be, friend? Without music in the body of Christ, where would we be? I love preaching, friend, but I tell you what, ain't nothing like the music. I mean, it's, I love preaching. It's important, but ain't nothing like the music. It's, um, and every song, so many of these songs are, the, it's a word. It's just the word being preached through music. Extend your right hand, everybody. Carrie, I want you to come join me out here. Bob Rogers, Charlie, Brother Wetzel, I want you to come join me. As a matter of fact, I want to sing in team that uh, Lori and y'all come down. Charity, Richard, come on down. Extend your right hand. Everyone else gather. Let's just gather around Lyndall. We speak. blessing on this man of God. We speak blessing. Open up the windows of heaven and Jesus drop into his heart the words, the notes, the choruses, the chords, the harmonies, everything Jesus. Drop it into his heart. Songs that we'll be singing years from now, Lord, that heaven even been pinned yet. Oh God, move in his life. Bless him, Jesus. Bless him. We lift him up to you, Lord. We lift him up in the name of Jesus. Bless him, Lord. We look forward. We look forward to singing the songs that you've birthed in Lyndall's heart. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, buddy. You, buddy. Remain standing. Choir, you can exit.
Hallelujah. I want us to, um, we're going to pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts, change our lives, but I want us all to, um, this is um, the prayer requests that have come in over the last day or, last week or so in our ministry, and each page represents sometimes 50 people, sometimes 100, sometimes 20, whole families that need to be saved, and um, I look at these, I mean, deliverance, 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 deliverance. These are deliverance from drugs, alcoholism. Think what these people are going through, friend. Deliverance, salvation, salvation, deliverance, salvation from homosexuality, deliverance, deliverance, marriage to be healed, deliverance, deliverance, healing and salvation in my family, healing of our marriage. It just goes on and on. These people are crying out. Now, we pray at our, our office. All our staff pray, I pray, and we also lay every prayer request on the table. But the Lord dealt with me today for this particular list. I don't know who's involved in this. I see the names of the people, but I don't know what God's doing here. But I want you also to extend your right hand this way and pray out loud with me right now. Jesus, Jesus. we're believing you believing for miracles. Every, Every life that is represented on that list, we pray that you would move, change lives, heal bodies, heal marriages, deliver from bondages. We pray for miracles in your precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're, 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 don't sit down. We're going to pray one more prayer. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. You're going to pray, Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life. If you're not a believer tonight, I want you to especially pray this prayer. Now, it may sound hypocritical to you, crazy to you, but I want you to pray this prayer. And if you want to, you can pray it, Jesus, if you're out there, if you're real, speak to my heart, change my life. But I want you to pray this prayer. God brought you here because, he's, because he loves you. I said, God brought you here because he loves you. He knows every one of us by name. Many of you guys from the Teen Challenge Center should be dead, but for some reason. How many of you, got, how many of you guys got friends that are dead? Every one of you. There's friends have died. Drug addicts, alcoholism, car wrecks, you name it, fights. They're dead, but you're alive. It's, it's like, why me, God? I asked that question for years when I first got saved because my friends are scattered all over the graveyards. Why me? Because he's got a plan. He's got a plan. I want you to pray with me, everyone. I want you to pray out loud right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your In your precious name, amen. amen. You may be seated. This is entitled, I don't know if I should share the title first. Turn with me to the book of John. One, one day, John Kilpatrick was standing up behind this podium. It was on a Sunday morning. And he said, turn to the book of John, and he was just, just goofing. He said, this is a book I wrote several years ago. <laughs> and people, there was people in the church that went, because they had just gotten saved and they didn't know anything, man. <laughs> I remember the first time we, we were serving communion. We were serving communion and we serve communion every Sunday, but uh, we're serving communion. There's always brand new people just got saved and they just, I was watching this one gentleman and a blue jeans t-shirt sitting out there and they gave him the, you know, the, the cup and they gave him the, uh, the bread and he goes, yeah. He thought it was a snack. And so, and I thought, this is so cool. This is so cool that there's no religion on these people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew. 
John 14. Would you turn there with me? I'm going to read uh, several scriptures tonight. The message only has three points to it. So um, everyone should be able to uh, stay with me with no problem, no matter how hard you work today. And if the person next to you dozes off, please don't wake them up. Just raise your hand. <laughs> so I can come close to them with a wireless mic and uh, catch them in the middle of a snore. I was in a church one time. You know, everybody's gone through stuff. I was in the back of a church and I was so tired. And the preacher was talking about Moses. And he goes uh, something like, and Steve Hill, what did Moses do? And I was asleep, but I heard, Steve Hill! And then everyone was staring at me. And so there's about 400 people in the church, and of course I was, you know, I was known in the church. And, uh, and so um, I figured that if I stood up and said, amen, <laughs> that there was a chance that that would fit. So I stood up and went, amen! <laughs> Didn't fit. <laughs> oh, you'll never catch me sleeping in church, friend. Ever. John 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. My, my, my. Because I go unto my Father. Now, what kind of things did Jesus do? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Minor stuff. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. And greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, we're going to get deeper now. Ephesians 6. Just a few scriptures. Stay with me. Ephesians 6. These are all spiritually related in the fact that there's a warfare going on. Jesus said, you will do greater things than I did. He cast out devils. How many would say that the devil knew the, nor the Lord's name? That, how many would believe that Jesus was known in hell? He went there, took the keys. He was known. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, a familiar scripture. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, those of you from Teen Challenge, we welcome everyone that's watching at home. We welcome those of you that are listening from our website. You've logged on to the website. We welcome you that are listening by radio. Tonight in the service, we have a group of Teen Challenge men that are from, is it North Carolina? From North Carolina. Teen Challenge is a Christian drug. Uh, I don't like to use the word rehabilitate because they don't really get rehabilitated. They get changed. And Teen Challenge is a Christian program where they go and they learn about Jesus. And many of these guys would testify to you that before they met the Lord, they were in bondage. Everyone say bondage. bondage. 
How many of you guys would say before you met the Lord, you were in bondage? Okay. 100%. How many would say now that you've met the Lord, you're free? If the world could just see that, that's incredible. But when I was in bondage with drugs, I didn't know there was a warfare going on. I didn't know anything about spiritual warfare. I was blinded to spiritual warfare. I didn't know there was demons and devils after me. I just did drugs. I just pumped needles in my arm, drank vodka, whatever I, I wanted to do, I did. Smoke, dope, party. I didn't know that the devil and demons were plotting my demise, that they wanted to kill Steve Hill. I didn't understand all that until I got saved. Then I found out there's a spirit, there's a spirit world out there that knows a lot about me and about you. That there's a spirit world out there that's after your soul. This is war. Somebody wants to kill you, sir. Somebody wants to kill you, sir. Somebody wants to kill you, ma'am. They're constantly plotting ways to destroy, to steal, to kill, and destroy. The devil wants to steal your salvation. He wants to come in and lie to you. Like, like a seed is planted tonight. I'm walking over ground, and I'm throwing out seed tonight. And some of you can ch choose to have fertile soil. You can choose for your soil of your heart to be fertile. And the seed falls on that soil. You let it fall into that soil. And you let something grow, a spiritual truth grow in your heart. And you give your life to Christ and you grow. Others, they reject it. This word is being preached. And they reject it. And it lays on top of a hard, hard heart. A hard, solid, crusty heart. And the birds of the air come down and they pluck that seed up. The devil will come down and he'll steal what God is trying to do. I didn't understand anything about all that stuff until I got saved. Now there's some scriptures in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. In a few minutes I'm going to use an illustration that everyone here will understand. But I want to lay the foundation before we do this. And there were seven sons of Sceva, Acts 19, verse 14, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Everyone say that. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? What did they try to do? They tried to cast out demons without the authority. I adjure you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. The devil says, I know Jesus and I'm familiar with Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on Le was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now I can share some other scriptures. I don't want you to turn there, but in Luke chapter 10, you're going to find out that the 70 returned with joy and found out that even the devils were subject unto them. Say even the devils. They returned with great joy and said, even the devils, John Davis, are subject unto us. That means these young whippersnappers were walking up to demon-possessed people that were frothing at the mouth, people that had passed by for years in their lives and could never do a thing for them. They were saying, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, loose her and let her go. And they were being delivered. And they came back to Jesus. They went, even the demons are subject to us. They're learning some of what Steve learned early on in his Christian life. And this was early on in their lives. And Jesus said, I beheld Satan. This is Luke 10, 17, 18 through 20. As lightning fall from heaven, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all, say all, all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Then he said, but don't rejoice in all that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Matthew 10, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast 
out devils. 1 John 3, 8, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, my message tonight is called, is titled, Beelzebub's Battle Book. Beelzebub's Battle Book. Beelzebub's, this is phonics, friend. Beelzebub's Battle Book. How do you spell Beelzebub? B, B, Beelzebub? Now, Beelzebub, Miel, I've got kids, friend, this is, and we homeschool. Beelzebub, and my kids will go, C-E-J? No, Beelzebub. B R F. No. B L Z B B E E L Z E B U B. B L Z B B's Battle Book. Now, if you're looking for a scripture with B L Z B B in it, it's in Matthew 10:25. Matthew 12, 24, Mark 3, 22, Luke 11, 15. It really doesn't matter. I'm just picking a name because it rhymed with battle book. <laughs> but it is interesting that most scholars will agree that Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. That's, that's cool. I mean, the devil, really. If there's one bug I could relate to, <laughs> I could... I'd put him with, it's a fly, just a fly. But the Lord of the flies, I believe that about you, devil. Um, there's other names about him, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary, the father of lies, Lucifer, son of the morning, the murderer, the prince of this world, the tempter, the list goes on and on, the God of this world, the wicked one. But tonight, everyone say tonight. tonight. Everyone at home say tonight. tonight. Huh? I'm going to put you on the front row. <laughs> Tonight, I want you to imagine with me a visit to Lucifer's library. I want you to imagine a visit to Lucifer's library. Please allow yourself to wander into Satan's study and begin to peruse the piles of poisonous periodicals. If the devil had a library, if Satan actually had a collection of books, I believe what I'm talking about tonight would be a part of it. As a matter of fact, this particular volume that I'm about to show you would probably be maintained and cared for, kept up to date, and guarded under lock and key. I can imagine the devil, or Beelzebub, using this eclectic resource during his strategic board meetings. I want you to imagine the devil having board meetings. I know you may think the devil's in a lot of your board meetings, but I'm talking about the devil having board meetings with his demons to strategize, to plan out your demise. They would sit around a huge table. That table would probably be manufactured from solid hardened lava rock, because you know, it's just hot down there. He would place this book in the center of the table and begin a discourse which would strike fear among the demons and cause their blood to boil. Now, I want the lights in the congregation just to go down a little bit. Leave the lights on up here. Can they do that? Do we have the technology? No one's touching nothing. It's okay if you can't do that. Charlie, bring that up. It really doesn't matter. This is Beelzebub's battle book, okay? It's hell's most hated, okay? I want those of you at home to see this because this is going to make an awful lot of sense to you in just a few minutes. See, we went over to the devil's house and found this in his library. 
And we said, how much you want for that book? He said, it's not for sale. So uh, Charlie stole it. <laughs> but there's something in here that you got to see. In Beelzebub's battle book, Hell's Most Hated, this is the most valuable possession that the devil would have in his library, in his archives. This would be under lock and key. This would be kept up to date. In just a minute, we're going to open it up, and it's going to make a lot of sense to you. But let me begin. Point number one. In the natural realm, there is a flurry right now of opinionated people running around trying to decide. Okay, get your mind away from the book. Okay, everybody, get it away from the book. How many's mind are away from the book? Can I move on? Okay. You'll see what's in the book in a minute. It's just like Christmas, isn't it? In the natural realm, there's a flurry of opinionated people running around trying to decide who is going to be the world's most influential or most wonderful person over the last millennium. There are all kinds of polls. Now, I said on the front of this thing, it says, hell's most hated. But right now, all over the world, they're trying to figure out who is the most appreciated, who is the most important person. How many of you have heard of some of these polls that are taking place? They're in every one of the magazines. I've got right here, Time Magazine, 100 years of the great heroes and icons. Here's Newsweek, America's Greatest, the Sluggers, the Hoopsters, and the Sports Superstars. Time Magazine lists a, a group of 20 people that they believe are get the Person of the Century Award. What blows my mind is Adolf Hitler's on that list. He's right under Bel Billy Graham. I just, I can't understand him. But Elvis Presley, Adolf Hitler, Billy Graham, Albert Einstein, Ronald Reagan, John Kilpatrick, John Lennon, Henry Ford. <laughs> Yeah. What number? Hmm. Let's move on. <laughs> but the New York Post also has a poll of the most, the 25 most influential people of the millennium. Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein, Christopher Columbus, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Galileo, Isaac Newton. These are people, you know, they're dead and gone, but these people are going to receive an award. I've got, uh, I think I got some more here. Let's see here. These are the 25 most important artists, authors, and dr dramatic writers and composers of the millennium. William Shakespeare, Wolfgang Mozart, Amadeus Mozart, Louis Beethoven, Beethoven uh, Lyndall Cooley, Leonardo da de Vinci. It's awesome. I don't know some of these people. Louis Armstrong. This, this will blow your mind. The 25 most evil people of the millennium. This is the New York Post. The 25 most evil people. This is not a joke poll. This is not a joke. This is a serious poll. Number one, Adolf Hitler. The most evil people of the millennium. Number one, Adolf Hitler. Number two, Bill Clinton. Hey, it's sad. And then it's Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, Joseph Mengele, and Hillary Clinton. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, friend, this is why they're trying to do whatever they can to clean up their legacy. Because these are real Americans that are not playing games. They just feel like there's a lot of evil there. And the list goes on. I'm Jack the Ripper is here, Ted Bundy, Ivan the Terrible, Fidel Castro, Jim Jones is way on down the list. The 25 most celebrated athletes of the century, Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, Carl Lewis, the list goes on and on. 25 most important people in the history of television, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, Ed Sullivan, the list goes on and on. 25 most influential people in motion picture history, Walt Disney, Alfred Hitchcock, Steven Spielberg, the list goes on and on. This is going on all over the world right now, and you're not, you haven't heard the end of it. 
People are trying to find out. Martin Luther King's on every one of these lists, not the evil ones, all the good ones. He's on all these lists. They're trying to figure out who gets, who deserves the top spot. People are chosen or nominated for several different reasons. Positive influence on society. Negative influence on society. Philanthropy. Are they active in politics or social issues? Their popularity or their looks? Financial success. Are they great entertainers? Great athletes? Remember, friend, we're going to this in just a minute. All these names, I look over them and go, yeah, great. He discovered gravity. Yeah, great. He discovered a cure for polio. That's awesome. Jonas Salk is awesome. Awesome what some of these people have done. Well, we're going to go deep in just a few minutes, friend. Real deep. Because there's another list swirling out there in the spirit realm that has nothing to do with the New York Post poll. Has nothing to do with the Time poll. And it's the real list. See, man, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Because I have refused him, for the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Which brings me to my next point. There's a lot of opinion polls going out there. We're moving from that, and I'm going to take you to the real one. In the spiritual realm, that was a natural. Everyone say spiritual. spiritual. There is an entirely different criteria to determine who has been the most influential person of the last millennium. In the spiritual realm, there is an entirely different criteria to determine who has been the most influential person of the last millennium. Now, in Hell's Most Hated, in Beelzebub's Battle Book, you find truth. Man looks at the outward. God looks at the heart. Satan knows who you are. He knows you. I don't care if 87 people think you're the greatest person in the world. The devil saw you in the back room with that girl that night. And so did the Lord. It doesn't make any difference if you pastor a thousand members. The devil saw you logging onto that website at one o'clock in the morning and lusting over those women on that computer screen. See, there's a real list out there. It's a true list out there. And there's some criteria to be a part of it. You've got to obtain something to be a part of it. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of the list. I want to be in this battle book. I want to be Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know. Let's go through this just for a second. I think I'm going to give you one characteristic, and then we'll look in the book for a minute. Humble. How many have heard of the 4-H club? Okay, this is going to be the 4-H club, but this is a 4-H holy club, okay? This is, these are 4-H's, okay, that will get you into this book. One of them is humble. The Bible says... Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up in James 4.10. There's been a lot of moving around in this room. Once y'all sit down, no one else moving around unless it's an emergency. In Isaiah 66, it says this, But to this man I will look, even to him that is poor, who is of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. Humility. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. God gives grace to the humble. I said God gives grace to the humble. 
I'm going to just go through this for the next few minutes. And since it's an old book, it's probably going to be hard. It probably hadn't been opened in a little while, so I'm going to try to open it. Ready? Y'all ready? It's amazing. <laughs> I see in this that um, the devil has already stamped out the cross. Because this is uh, the cross is absolutely an abomination in hell. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago. So in Beelzebub's battle book, You'll find the cross, and he'll do anything he can to stamp out the preaching of it. He'll do anything he can to stamp out anyone teaching on it. Preacher, you can talk social issues all you want, but when you start talking Jesus, when you start talking about the blood, when you start talking about Calvary, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get the devil's attention. I just want to show you a few people that are found that I found in his book. Here's a man, and we're talking about some criteria to get in to the devil's book. This is James Bainham. Never heard of him, Steve. Oh, I wish we all had. Because if it wasn't for people like this, you wouldn't be here. Young people, this is 1532. This man's being martyred in England for his faith. As the flames are consuming the flesh on his hands, this is what he said. Behold, everyone, you look for a miracle, and here you have a miracle. For in this fire I feel no pain. It's as if I am in a bed of roses. And he washes his hands in the flames as his body is consumed. Humble man, holy man, deny Christ? No, sir. Satan was waiting around that bonfire, hoping that this man would become a mockery to the cross of Christ. And he would say something like, I don't love him, I don't know him, but no friend. Not a chance. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and give you these characteristics. I'm going to do this now, and we're going to go through this because I feel the Lord moving in this place. Humble, holy. Everyone say holy. holy. The Bible says in Hebrews 12:14, "Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord." First Peter 1:16, "Be ye holy, for I am holy." 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, you are called unto holiness. Hot. Humbleness. Holiness. Hot. Hot. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 139, my zeal has consumed me. Jesus said in Revelation 3, 3, 15 and 16, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. I know I'm supposed to lay this foundation before I show you some of these pictures because some of you have no clue what's fixing to happen. Humble. Holy. You know what holiness is, friend? Holiness is not how you wear your hair. Holiness is how you carry your heart. Holiness is what's inside of you. Right with God. Are you right with God? Are you doing things that Jesus would never do? People ask me all the time why I love reading the old writers. And some of the people I'm going to show you, many of you have never heard of them before. But I consume their material. Why? Because they were holy. I'm going to show you a picture of Jeremy Taylor. His famous volume used to carry, they used to carry it around. Everyone would ride around with, with, with 
Saddlebags back in the 1600s, the 1500s, way before cars and bicycles. And they would carry these saddlebags. And everyone carried around a book called Holy Living and Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor. Holy living and holy dying. When I first got a hold of it, Pastor, I couldn't read three pages. Rips you to shreds. That's why they were used of God to work miracles. That's why the power came down, because they got so holy. George Whitfield got a hold of a book called The Life of God in the Soul of Man by a man named Henry Schoolgill, who when he was 14 years old, he was teaching at the, in Scotland at the seminary at age 14. He wrote a book, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. George Whitfield got a hold of it, and as he read it, you know what he said in there? He said, and this is in paraphrase, so you think you're holy. So you think you're holy. He said, what would happen to you if every thought that you've thought over the last 24 hours was written on the wall for everyone to read. Everybody wonders why George Whitfield is so mighty used of God. Because he got holy after reading that book. He got saved. He says that book led him to God. He got saved right. Humbleness, holiness, hot on fire for God. A blaze. This is the criteria, friend, to get into this book tonight. And trust me, everyone at home, you want to be in Beelzebub's battle book. This is the book you want to be in. Because if you're known in hell, you're known in heaven. Hot. And then the last one is harvest. Humbleness. Holiness. Hot on fire for Jesus. And then harvest. Jesus said, everyone say, Jesus said. Jesus. Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What do you not understand about that? Those of you that are praying for God's will in your life and you're sitting around twiddling your thumbs, it's a whole lot easier to steer a moving car than it is one sitting still. Move out! People tell me they want to be an evangelist like me. And I'll say, then go out into the park and preach. That's what I've done for years. What do you think we do all over the nation? This nation, we've done it. And in other nations, we'll go into a train station and preach in the train station. Nobody knows me. There's no Lyndall Cooley. There's no person playing music in the background. It's just hardcore evangelism. Because Jesus said, go. He didn't say, wait till I talk to you again about it. He said, go. So the ones I'm about to show you are the ones that Satan saw. Humility. Holiness. They were white hot. And they answered the call to harvest. And when they answered that call to harvest, they got put in this book. And I want to tell you, the devil was after them. I got a picture tonight of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. I've got an original, one of these from the, it's an old print from the early 1800s. I love it. And I did something here. This is the 12 disciples right before the crucifixion. And there's one here that was removed. It was removed. You've always looked for Judas holding the bag. Well, Satan looks at this picture and he goes, John, no. Matthew, no. After him, boys. Get them, boys. Get them. Get Peter. Get him. Do you have any idea what he's going to be like when he gets filled with the Holy Ghost? Get him. And then the demons turn to Jesus and say, well, what about Judas? No problem. I've removed him. He's not in the book. I want to tell you, friend, listen up tonight. 
There's been a time where Satan has sat down and strategized with the demons of hell over every picture that I'm about to show you. And he said, bring them down, bring them down, bring them down. But he failed. He failed. And they're in his archival book right now just as a warning to the devil and to, to the demons. He holds up John Flavel. And tonight if the devil was in a board meeting with his pals, he would hold his picture up and would say, don't you remember him? He wrote that book on keeping the heart. He caused hundreds of thousands of people to turn to holiness. And then once they turned to holiness, they stayed holy because he wrote his book on keeping the heart. And his motto was, it's, it's one thing to come to the Lord and get your heart washed. It's another thing to keep it washed. And he wrote the manual on how to keep it washed back in the 1600s. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! No, they couldn't do it. Jeremy Taylor, holy living and holy dying. I'm moving quickly, friend. How many Bible school students have wanted to find a verse of Scripture, but they couldn't find it? Well, a man back in the 1600s said, I'm going to help you. His name was Alexander Cruden, and he said, I'm going to put together a concordance. That means when a Scripture, when some verb or some word comes to their mind, they can look it up in my book back in the 1600s. He said, I'm going to help everyone find every Scripture they're looking for, Alexander Cruden. And I promise you, friend, Satan was going, stop him. Stop him! Stop him! Because to this day, I carry with me the Cruden's Concordance. Kill him! Don't you remember demons? It's Jonathan Edwards. Don't you remember that day? Sinners in the hands of an angry God where they ripped the pews apart with their fingernails. He's sitting around the table, and every one of these pictures that are held up represent Christ in these people, and the demons are trembling. Friend, I feel this. Those of you at home, this woman of God represents every praying grandma, every mama out there. This is Susanna Wesley. Susanna Wesley, on her knees, she took care of business with God. She said, I got some boys, God. They're a little unruly, but I'm going to train them up in your ways because you say, Father, that they will not depart from it. And when they were little kids and they were around the breakfast table and little Jonathan said, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, amen. Susanna would say, no, Jonathan, you're four now. You're not going to pray those repetitive prayers anymore. Now you're going to talk to Jesus. That was good when you were two and three, but now you're four. Get to know Jesus. The devil's going, don't you remember her? She was a thorn in our flesh. She raised up her boys at age four. They started knowing Jesus. They started talking to Jesus. Next news you know, her son, John Wesley, is saying these words. When people come to him and they say, how do you attract such crowds of 20,000, 15,000, 25,000? He says, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. Yeah. Remember what I said? Hot, humble, holy, hot harvest. John Wesley. Oh, don't even know about this young lady, but the devil and his demons do. Susan Huntington, she was a member of the hierarchy in England. She was a member of the great English family. She had more power than anyone in this room or anyone who's ever visited this room. And we've had governors in this place. Susan Huntington was a member of the great family in England, the royal family. And guess who her best friends were? 
John Wesley, Charles Wesley, Philip Doddridge, Fletcher, John Fletcher, all these great men of God. And she would bring them into the royal palace. And because she had such power, she would call people over and say, Bill, come here. I want you to meet some of my friends. He would come over and say, who's this? This is Reverend Wesley, Reverend Doddridge, Reverend Fletcher. Charles is going to sing a song. And then Wesley is going to preach. And they had what they call the anxious seat. They would take the anxious seat and they'd put you in it. Could you imagine sitting there with Charles Wesley singing a song to you and then John Wesley preaching and Philip Doddridge or Charles uh, or uh, Whitfield, George Whitfield giving the altar call? You're dead meat, friend. You're the only one in the congregation. Susan Huntington. I'm talking about people that were known in hell. How many will stay with me for a couple more minutes? George Whitfield. Humble. Holy. Hot. 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 And harvest. I went to his church, those of you from the north, in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And I went up to his church and and I banged on the door, and no one was there. And I was determined to find out where George Whitfield was buried. And so I found the pastor's name of the church, and I called the pastor. And I said, I gotta go, I gotta see the grave of George Whitfield. He said, well, it's inside the church. And he said, I'm busy. And I said, I've come across country. I wanna see his grave. And he said, I'll be right over. And he came over. This is a creepy guy, man. He comes over and he goes, you want to see the grave of Whitfield? <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, come here. <laughs> and he walks behind the platform and he shows me some stairs going down into a dungeon. He said, follow me. True story, Fred. <laughs> Go all the way down to this dungeon. Musty. Must just exactly what you imagine an old, old, musty dungeon to be like. And I go in, and he goes, he's right over there. And I looked over, and there's this skull. A skull sitting on top of this tomb underneath. He goes, he's buried under the pulpit. And he said, he's almost all there except one arm. Somebody stole his arm. <laughs> I don't know why I shared that. I just thought you might want to know that. <laughs> I wanted to be around a man who, who could preach to 25,000 people without a microphone. And that, when he was here, Boston, when Whitfield was in the United States, Boston had 25,000 people in it. He preached to all 25,000. The whole city shut down to come here and preach. So it's, you know, it's, I, I, it would be wise for you to get some of his writings. Robert Murray McShane, a holy man of God in Scotland. They used to call him Holy McShane. This is the only painting that was ever done, and he did it himself. He looked at himself in a mirror, and he drew the picture. I walked into McShane's church. I'm talking about people that are in Beelzebub's battle book. These are people, Lindell, that hell fought. McShane was sick for his entire ministry. He stayed sick. Those of you who get a little headache, think the devil's after you. He was, McShane spent half his life in the bed, but somehow he managed to shake Scotland. And I walked into his church in Dundee, Scotland. Yeah, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those uh, pilgrimage people. I love pilgrimages, friend. I went to his church, and this man right here was hanging in, a picture of him was hanging in the church. And McShane pastored back in 1840 in that church. 
And I didn't ever, I didn't know who this guy was. And I said, who's he? And he goes, you don't know who he is. And he said, that's William Burns. He goes, that's the man that was here when the fire fell. And I said, he's the one that was here when Robert Murray McShane was in Israel and the power came down here in Dundee and people began moaning and groaning and weeping inside and outside the church. I said, yeah, he was the one. And then I said, well, what's that outfit? Oh, after that, after that, he chose to leave all the fame and glory of revival and he went to work in the slums of China, never to return. probably the greatest evangelist alive. He said, I'm out of here. Right in the middle of the revival. Hudson Taylor, oh, I can go on and on. Charles Finney. These are people that are in Beelzebub's battle book. I don't know about you, friend. You can have your time polls. You can have your Newsweek. You can have your New York Post polls. I want to be in this book. Jesus. God. D.L. Moody. Charles Spurgeon. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, fire and blood. E.M. Bounds, a man whose his, his words taught Leonard Ravenhill all about prayer. Evan Roberts, the man who led the Great Wells Revival, all in Beelzebub's battle book. Leonard Ravenhill, the man who I was blessed to be mentored by for three years, who wrote why, he wrote why revival tarries. The Cambridge Seven, great missionaries to China. William Seymour. Oh, hell hated this man. Hell hated William Seymour, the one-eyed black man, friend, that this church wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for William Seymour. He believed God. And when the revival broke out on Bonnie Bray Street in a little house, they moved out. The power of God was coming down. People were being filled with the Holy Ghost. They moved out to the front porch, and then the front porch collapsed. And William Seymour had to make a decision. Do we move this small revival meeting to bigger quarters to handle more people? And they decided to, and they moved to Azusa Street. Little did he know that he was going to be used of God. And less than 100 years later, there would be over 600 million Pentecostals. Six hundred million in the world today. And it started in a little shack. Beelzebub's battle book. He's showing these to his demons. He's going, remember and weep. Some of the founding fathers of this church The devil's showing these to his demons. And he's saying, I told you to kill R.L. Berry. I told you to kill Brother Stanton. But you didn't. And now look. This is years ago, friend. This is Brownsville. This is the first Brownsville church. Now the devil's going, now look. Those men, those two that I just named are in this picture. They're here tonight working the Brownsville revival. And the devil said, I told you to kill them. We couldn't. We couldn't. They're hot. They're holy. They're humble. And they're into the harvest.
harvest. They're protected by the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Nicole, Jessica, Casey, martyred December 1st, 1997 in Ohio or in Kentucky, Paducah. But the devil says, I'm warning you. I'm warning you, demons. You remember this one. You remember him. Don't you remember the Lamb of God, the shepherd of the sheep? Remember when he walked on this earth? His very name made us tremble. Now he's multiplied. Now he's everywhere. Do you remember the day? Do you remember the day he resurrected? Do you remember the day he floated off the earth? Do you remember the day? Do you remember the day? And then the devil's saying this. Listen to me, demons. Beelzebub is saying, we've got work to do. We've got work to do. Because now, still got Billy Graham with us. Still got Richard Crisco. to go on. Bill Bush, where are you at? He's here somewhere. You're hated in hell, Bill Bush, because you have helped thousands of people find a seat at the Brownsville Revival. You've led thousands through the internet all the way to this revival took care of groups of 75, 100, 25, or two. Bill Bush, you're hated. Charity, you're in the book. His battle book. He hates your guts. He hates you. Thank God for it. Little. You're in the book. He despises you. He'll do anything to keep a new course from coming to your head. He'll discourage you. He'll bring others to discourage you because he knows that you're a firebrand in God's hands. I don't know if Benny's out here tonight. But if you are, Benny, if you're watching, Benny, you represent Benny, every worker in this revival. I can't remember a night when Benny wasn't here playing the bass, playing the harp. Hazel comes, she's here all the time, singing for the Lord. You're, you're hell's most hated. They hate you. They hate you. You're in the right book. Carrie Robertson, you're in the right book. Dr. Youngie Cho, you're in the right book. Tom Trask, the head of the Assemblies of God, if he was here tonight, he'd go like this. <laughs> if you've never met him, friend, you will meet him. He'll smack you right on the face. He goes, Steve! <laughs> Hector Ferreira, you were here last week, you're known in hell! <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Michael Brown, wherever you are tonight. You're known in hell. Oh, man, I'm losing my voice, but it's worth it. Steve Whitehead, hell hates you. You're in Beelzebub's battle book because you're humble, you're holy, you're hot, you're white hot for Jesus, and you're into the harvest. This man runs a TV ministry here. If it wasn't for him, people wouldn't be getting saved in Bangkok because they get the ta tonight's tape. I will get letters six months from now from people in Australia that are getting saved from tonight's tape because of him. Randy Royal, you're trouble. Devil don't like you, buddy. Van Lane, you're messing with those kids. Brother Corbin's not here tonight, but I want somebody to give him the tape. Brother Corbin and Sister Corbin, you're known in hell. You're in Beelzebub's battle book. 88 years old, and you want to know where he was this week? He's 88. He was at the Awake America in Monroe, Louisiana, laying hands on people. <laughs> Reinhard Bonke. <laughs> Bob Phillips. You're known down there, buddy. Hell hates you, Sherry. Hell hates you. I hate you. You're in the battle book. You're in the book, man. Bob Rogers, you're known down there, buddy. Hell hated you in Youth with a Mission. Hell hated you when you were the crusade director for David Wilkerson Ministries. Hell hated you when you were in L.A. planning that church. And hell hates you in Dallas. And hell hates you now. Thank God hell hates you. Alvy and Verna, I want you to stand. This is Bob Rogers' parents. You're in Beelzebub's battle book. You have fought hell over the years, but you've kept integrity number one. You remain faithful. You remain holy, a man after God, a woman after God. Hell hates you, he hates your prayers. The devil hates your prayers. They'll do anything to stop them from getting anywhere, but they keep shooting straight up to God. Why? Because you're holy, you're humble, you're white hot, and you're always talking about the harvest. This is Bob Rogers' parents. <laughs> the Lutheran minister, Hugh Monzingo, that led me to the Lord. Young people going after God. Mama, this is my mama. She prayed me into the kingdom. You're in Beelzebub's battle book, mama. Singing team, you're in the book. The choir, you're in the book. They can't stand you. Lila Terhune, you're in the book. Charlie. You're in the book, buddy. Brenda Kilpatrick's not here. She's in the book. John Kilpatrick, you're in the book, buddy. Now, he is in the book, and you see how big his picture is. I'm in the book, too, but my picture's real little because I'm humble. I'm in trouble now. I think I'll close it.
Bring that out, Charlie. There's only one place you want to be, my friend. Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. Robert and Joanne. Stand, buddy. Made Let me tell you something, Robbie. You're a Native American Indian. Hell hates you because you're so on fire for God. You got a burden for souls. That's why you get attacked. Because hell hates you. You're in Beelzebub's and Bub's battle book. You're in there, buddy. Thank God you're in there. Thank God, buddy. Thank God you're in there. John Davis, hell can't stand you. You've led thousands of people to Jesus over the years. That's why you go through some of the things you go through, brother. Hell can't stand you. You're in the book, man. And right now, the demons of hell are sitting around the table. They're going, what are you going to do about him? Kill him! Brother Wetzel, you've been known in hell from the beginning. You've been known in hell. Hell hates you. Hated your dad. Hated your dad because your dad raised up this man. He'll hate you. You're in the book. What about you, friend? Brother Joe? I want to tell you something, brother. Hell can't stand you. Hell hates you. Why? Because you've been in this revival ever since the beginning. I can't remember a day when I looked up at this church up in the right hand corner and there was Brother Coffin worshiping God, going after the Lord. I don't know where your wife is right now, brother, but you both are known in hell. They got your name. They got your picture. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God! and breathing, Jesus. Sister Noel, you love the Lord, don't you, sis? Singing the gospel. My, 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 you should have never started doing that. Hell hates you. Hell hates you, sister. Thank God. Thank God. I tell you what I want to be, friend. I want to be table talk in hell. I want to be today's conversation down there. <laughs> Kathy, let me tell you something about yourself. You've been taking a lot of pictures of people. You've sent out reports all over the world on this revival. You have caused tens of thousands to get hungry for God. Your pictures have been shown all over the world. Scarcely a day doesn't go by where one of your pictures is not being put in a newspaper or a book around the world on revival. You're humble. 
you're holy. You're hot on fire for Jesus, and you're always talking harvest. Uh-oh. You're in Beelzebub's battle book. Open the book. It's a long way for it to travel from hell, that sound. <laughs> My friend, I don't care about being in the world's most wonderful. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference to me if I ever make a New York Post poll. This don't matter. Leonard Ravenhill used to say to me, it makes no difference to me if your name is plastered in every newspaper across the country. It has absolutely no effect on me if your ministry is broadcast on every network around the world. Who cares if your name has become a household word across America? Word across America. So what if you have a worldwide ministry with thousands of supporters? Big deal if you ever, if you have hundreds of thousands of names on your mailing list. What does it matter if you pack out stadiums from coast to coast? None of this amounts to a hill of beans to me, he would say to Steve. I want to know one thing, Steve Hill. Are you known in hell? Does the devil know your name? Are you on his hit list? Are you a threat to the kingdom of darkness? Now, at the beginning of this message, I share with you scriptures. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I give you powers over principalities, demons, devils. Go cast out devils. Raise the dead. Heal the sick. They came back rejoicing, saying, even the demons, the devils are subject to us. Greater things will you do in my name, Jesus said. But I wonder how many of us in this room haven't even come close to that. You're not living for Jesus. You're definitely not in Beelzebub's battle book. You don't know the Lord. See, there's only one book you want to be a part of, friend. I don't want to just make it in heaven. I want to empty hell. I want to bring millions of people with me to heaven. I want to be a threat to the darkness. Those of you young people that are on fire for God, you don't want to just make it to heaven. And I don't want to hear those lousy testimonies of, well, I've lived for Jesus all my life. Did you do anything for him all your life? That's great that you lived for Jesus all your life. Did you do anything for him? Were you a threat to the kingdom of darkness? I'm glad you made it to heaven. But when you get there, you're going to want to see a trophy. You're going to want to wear a crown. You're going to, you're going to want to look down that marriage supper of the Lamb and see thousands of people that were saved, or hundreds, or tens, or maybe you prayed. Maybe you prayed for us, and that was your ministry was prayer. And because you prayed for us, we were able to win millions of people to Jesus. Everyone stand. Those of you with the chairs, moving to the left and the right.
I tell you, friend, I've been working on this all day long today for one reason. You. You. Where did you buy all that stuff? We make all that stuff. I find stuff and running all over the place, getting this laminated, get it all fixed up, making it, get it all together, getting all the pictures in there. Why? Because I care about you. I don't wake up in the morning and get some old sermon to preach. God's fresh. He serves fresh bread. Those of you that are backslidden in this room, those of you in the balcony, those of you on this main floor, you're backslidden and you know it. In just a minute, you're going to get so right with God, it's scary. You're going to be a threat to the kingdom of darkness. You're going to get right with God. You're going to get to sin out. Everyone say sin. Sin. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Let me tell you what some of you need to do. Look this way, everybody. Don't be distracted. Some of you are going to get a grip on this sin in your life. Those movies, those things you have at home. If you can't show it on Sunday morning in front of the whole church, then it's sin. Come to the Brownsville Revival. We will define sin. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Some of you didn't get that. But I'm saying, can you go home? Can I go over to your house, blindfolded, grab any video out of your video cabinet, bring it to the church, and slap it in the deck without you knowing which one it is, and you're not going to be nervous at all? And allow me to say, I found this in so-and-so's home, and he's sitting right there. It wouldn't matter to you which video I picked out because they're all clean. Or is it that you've got some junk? And you'll allow filth to come into your mind, filth to go into your eye gate, filth to go into your ears. But boy, when you come to church, you're, you're sanctimonious. You're holy. But alone, you're a different person. Friend, there's not two Jesuses. There's not a Jesus at home and a Jesus at church. There's one Jesus. You can get upset if you want, friend, but I'm trying to get you into heaven. I want you to make it to heaven. Those of you that have never known the Lord, a few minutes ago I held up a picture of Jesus as a shepherd. He went as a lamb to the slaughter for you. Holy, humble, hot for God's will. That's all he did. I must do my Father's will. I must do my Father's will. Harvest, that's all he thought about. Harvest. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He ate, drank, and breathed harvest. He was crucified 2,000 years ago for you, my friend. He bled a real death. He bled real blood. He died a real death. He was pierced, slapped, cursed, mocked for you. Greater love has no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. He died for you 2,000 years ago. Those of you that have never known the Lord, I'm asking you tonight, what are you going to do about it? Those of you listening by radio, what are you going to do about it? Tonight, I want you to pray with me, and I want you to get into this book, Beelzebub's battle book. I want you to get in Satan's book. If you're in Satan's book, trust me, your name's written down in the Lamb's book. To get into this one, you're automatically in the other one. When devil says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, you need to be able to put your name there. And if your name's on his lips like that, it's, it's written in the Lamb's book. Those of you that have never known the Lord, you're going to come and get right with Jesus in just a minute. And those of you that are spiritual, you're religious, you do spiritual things, but you don't know God. You're the laughing stock of hell. You think hell's nervous every Sunday morning? I believe that that's joke time in hell. I can see in hell, large screen television set up everywhere. 
or the devil's boardroom, large screen television of church services. And the devil going, I bet you, I bet you uh, two pounds of hot tamales that that church service is going to be over in an hour and five minutes. You're on. Bet you, bet you this, bet you that, that the preacher won't preach more than 30 minutes. And I bet you Lucille falls asleep after five minutes. They're sitting there watching. Why? Same old, same old. Religion, 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 religion. But boy, then when the pastor announces a prayer meeting and that next Saturday morning, five or ten of those church parishioners show up at that prayer meeting, the devil gets up from his seat and he goes, wait just a minute. What's going on? What are they doing at 6 o'clock in the morning praying? He starts calling the demons. Who is he? Who is she? Who is that girl? Who is that man? After him. Friend, and there's a little artist down in hell starting to sketch your picture. Next news you know, you're going to be in the same book Whitfield's in. His battle book. Religion will damn you, friend. You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with baptismal waters dripping from your face. You can go to hell with a certificate of ordination hanging across behind your desk. You can go to hell with a WWJD bracelet on. Or, yes, Lord, we will ride sticker on the back of your car. I'm asking you, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Charity, I want you to come join me. Want to know how many times I've heard this girl complain? See this girl right here? I've heard her complain in four and a half years. Zero times. Zero. Four and a half years. I've never heard one negative word come from her mouth. Hell hates that. How is it that all these revival leaders can still be together after four and a half years? Hell hates unity. Hell hates unity. Tonight, friend, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give an altar call. And those of you that got sin in your life, you're going to get down here quick. You're not going to hesitate. And before I do this, I'm going to bind the devil when I bind him, that shackle that's around your leg, you know you need to get right with God. You know you need to get into this one book. You know you need to be holy. You need to be on fire for God. You need to get to sit out. You need to be involved in God's harvest. You need to humble yourself and humble. Let me talk about that, friend. The only thing that's going to hold you back tonight in the balcony and down here on the main floor, the only thing that's going to hold you back is pride. The Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if you know there's sin in your life and you can't break away, you ain't never going to make it into that book, friend. God resists you. See, the ones in this book, friend, you get in this book, you're saved and on fire. You're saved and on fire. I know, friend, the truth of the matter is, this room couldn't hold the pictures of people that are saved and on fire. This is just a sampling. And if I missed your picture, forgive me. I told my staff that I'm not going to put any other picture in here. That's why I didn't point to Jeff tonight. I told my staff I'm not going to put any of their pictures in. They're all in there, though. They're all in there. They're on fire for God. Live for God. But I'm going to bind the devil. The only thing that will hold you back is pride. If you need to get right with God, you're going to step out. As soon as I bind the devil, Charity's going to sing mercy seat. If you need to get the sin out of your life and you want to become a threat to the kingdom of darkness, you want, when you wake up in the morning, you want hell to wake up too. When you wake up, you want the devil to go, she's up. He's up. 
That's the kind of threat you need to be. You need to be that powerful in the spirit realm. Because Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. You're going to be casting out devils, healing the sick. You need to be a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And if you're not, you're going to hit these altars. You're going to get right with God. That's why you're at the Brownsville Revival tonight. And those of you at home, you're going to kneel right there in, that in front of that TV set. Those of you listening in your automobiles, you're going to pray right there in your car. I'm going to bind the devil. When I bind him, he's going to be totally... Without strength, without power, when I bind him in Jesus' name, he's not going to be able to do anything to you. The shackle is going to come undone. And you have freedom to move out and come down here. But if you don't, and you know you're supposed to, remember this is a spirit war. The devil's watching you. He knows about the sin. So does Jesus. If you don't come down, that shackle's going to come across your leg again. And you might as well turn to the devil and say, Devil, I don't want Jesus tonight. I don't want to get right with God. You might as well say to the devil, I want you. Because there's no gray area. I'm going to bind the devil. If you need forgiveness, if you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, if you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, if you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, if you need forgiveness, if you need God to cleanse you, if you want to be in devils, the bells above hell's most hated list, then you're going to come. Satan, I bind you in Jesus' name. Loose him and let him go. Loose her and let her go. Now, come on. If you need forgiveness, hurry, 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 and kneel at the altar. Kneel at the altar. Kneel here at the altar. Come on. In the darkness. Hurry. Hurry. Everything hurry. is Kneel at the altar. I face the power of sin on my own. I do Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Kneel at the altar and stay there. Kneel at the altar. battle book this is war this is war friend do you think this is a game do you think this is child's play this is heaven and hell light and darkness Jesus and the devil you want to be in this book friend you want to be on the devil's ten most wanted list you want to be hated in hell Jesus I know and Paul I know you want to be on that list get on your knees and ask the Lord to wash you cleanse you and make you brand new come on come on come on come on hurry 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 God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, son. Come on. 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 Come on, son. Make a mark. 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 Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! His grace will be His grace will be accompanying. His Father flow freely. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on!
altar, keep your heads bowed. Friend, we ain't playing games and God's not playing games and I promise you the devil's not playing games. He knows exactly what's up with this message. He knows every scripture I preached on tonight and he knows every man, woman, and child that I depicted by showing a picture just then. He knows them, he knew them, he knew exactly what kind of threat they were to his kingdom. And friend, you need to determine in your heart tonight that you are gonna wreak havoc on hell, that for the rest of your life, you are gonna be one of those that the devil despises. Quit being a friend of Satan. Everyone at the altar, keep your heads bowed. I'm going to do one more thing and then we're going to close. I need the team out here. We're going, to, we're going to sing, Lord, have mercy. And I want everyone to do something. Everyone at the altar, stay where you're at. But everyone else, turn to the person next to you and ask them this question. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? Wait before you do it. When someone turns to you and asks you that question, don't lie. Don't lie. Don't lie. You tell them the truth. If you need forgiveness... If you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, you tell him the truth and say yes. And then both of you are going to come down here together. In the balcony, listen up. I'm not playing games with you tonight, friend. Everyone at the altar, keep your heads bowed. But I tell you what, this year has been a scary year. Have you noticed every single, almost every month, sometimes every other week, there's another disaster in this nation? Have you noticed that? If you haven't seen that, friend, we've never had a year like this year. From the Columbine shootings to the Atlanta shootings, to the Kennedy plane going down, to Egypt air going down, to a bonfire being built out in Texas, and for the first time in 50 years, a thing collapses and 15 kids die. This is a strange year. What do you think is going on, friend? You think this is tiddlywinks? You think this is some type of game? Satan is out there to steal, to kill, and destroy. Begin to stand up and act like a man. Stand up and act like a woman of God. Take authority over the devil and the demons of darkness. Rise up, my friend, and do something. If, you're, if you need forgiveness, you tell that person yes. I want everyone to turn to the person next to them. Ask them if they need forgiveness. When someone turns to you and asks you that, if you need Jesus to forgive you, say yes. And then both of you come together. Both of you come together. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. at the altar keep your heads bowed sister Knowles I want you to come up here just for a minute I want you to come on up here everyone at the altar keep your heads bowed just break your way through the crowd right through there if you would sis I want you to do me a favor and sing amazing grace just acapella can you do that for me help her up would you this is not a concert this is for those of you that aren't up here people are still coming sister just give her one of your microphones if she needs a key you can give out doubt if she needs a key Everyone at this altar, keep your heads bowed. If you're coming, you've got about 60 seconds to come. You've got 60 seconds. Satan hates this song. He hates this song. He's heard this so many times, Pastor, as people came forward. Come on, sister, sing this. Amazing grace. Come on, friend. How sweet come on the sound God bless you yeah come on that saved a wretch like me hurry hurry I once was lost come on but now I will.
who's blind but now I see Sister, I'm gonna ask you to do that one more time. There's somebody here, everyone at the altar, stay kneeled, stay where you're at. Those of you at home, get on your face before God. But everyone here, there's a man in this room, you were once on fire for God, but you've drifted away. You've drifted away. I'm gonna have her sing this one more time. I'm gonna tell you, friend, you were in that book and you remember when you were in that book. You remember you were a threat to the kingdom of darkness, but then you drifted away, you fell. The Lord brought you here tonight, and he's telling you, get back in the book. God bless you, sir. You can get back in that book tonight, and God's going to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Sing it one more time. Come on. Come on. Grace. Come on, ma'am. Come on, sir. How sweet, how sweet the sound. God bless the you, sis. Saved, come on, come on. Saved a wretch. Got 30 seconds, let's go. Me. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh, I once, come on. I once was lost. God oh, bless you, sis. But thank God. God bless you, sis. Thank God. God bless you, sis. Thank God. God bless you, son. I found I was blind, but now I see. God bless both of you. Just kneel right there. God's brought you here tonight. There is victory in the camp tonight. Everyone at the altar, everyone at the altar, bow your heads. Those of you at home, bow your heads. I want you to pray out loud with me. Don't mumble. I want you to pray this. I want hell to hear every word of this. Right now, pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for this Friday night. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me here, for speaking to me, for not leaving me alone. Jesus, I want my life to count. I don't care about the world's lists, but I do care about your list and hell's list. And tonight, Jesus, I want to make sure I'm part of hell's most hated. So I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me. I have sinned I have hurt you, I have hurt others, and I've hurt myself. Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. I repent. Tonight, Jesus, I give myself to you. Be my Savior, be my Lord, be my best friend. From this moment on, I'm sold out to you. I am yours and you are mine ask me to do something and i'll do it i'm yours and you're mine in your precious name in jesus name amen glory